Good morning. Uh, this is the first uh, or the, the third in our webinar series. Um, we'll get going here. Uh, we have uh, Dave Van Lar, who's our engineering manager at IMW Industries. Uh, Dave has 10 years with IMW and uh, he has a mechanical engineering degree from the University of British Columbia. Uh, Dave's um, experience includes uh, 10 years at BC Hydro as well as several um, tech manufacturing companies in the uh, Lower Mainland. Um, Dave's been heavily involved in the past in our R&D programs including um, increasing the capacity and size of our current uh, compressor system up to the 300 horsepower level. Uh, key roles in developing our current pressure reduction system and module technology which you'll be uh, discussing today. Uh, as well as uh, the development on our mobile units. Um, most applicable to today's discussion, uh, Dave has been uh, integral in the uh, recent development of our full fill technology, allowing us to get a greater fill in uh, transport trailers for CNG, as well as our max offload capacity technology uh, that helps us do industry-leading offload, maximizing uh, the, the actual capacity of a turnaround on, on uh, CNG transport. Now IMW um, has been manufacturing uh, compressors since 1984 and uh, has been uh, in existence for 100 years since 1912. Uh, we are owned by Clean Energy Fuels of Los Angeles, California, a public company in the NASDAQ, and uh, well known for the development of the natural gas highway across the United States. I'd like to uh, welcome, obviously, all of our uh, professional engineering attendees and make sure that you're aware of our continuing ed education credits. Uh, this session will um, count for one uh, technical informal hour uh, and uh, if you want um, your, CD, your CPD credit, and I know that many of your human resources departments have gathered you around a boardroom table today, so there could be several of you watching this in one boardroom, please uh, email to webinars at imw.ca the name, job, title, company, and email address of each attendee, whether you're individual or by group and we will make sure that we forward you the required proof for your technical credit. Uh, we encourage everyone to join the discussion uh, throughout the session uh, simply by using the chat function you'll see to the right of your screen. Uh, if you simply enter that, we are monitoring these questions throughout the session and uh, we'll do the Q&A at the end and if there's specific pertinent things in the middle um, may, may halt the, the, uh, the presentation just to answer those. But please uh, send us your questions and we will respond to them. So again, uh, today our speaker is David Van Lahr. He's a professional engineer and manager of our engineering and product solutions group at IMW Industries and uh, we'll be speaking on the topic of uh, industrial gas transportation today. And without further ado, here's Dave. Well, hello everyone. Uh, yeah, so delivering cost-effective natural gas to your remote facility is, is the topic today. Um, and so we'll start with a, a brief overview of natural gas. Um, some of you are very familiar with this, others not as much. Um, but I thought I'd start with this to at least uh, give some background. So what is natural, compressed natural gas? Um, basically, natural, compressed natural gas is, is about 95% methane. Uh, we normally store it around 3,600 psi or 250 bar. Uh, we use specially designed containers for that. Um, CNG always stays in a gaseous form. It's different than liquefied natural gas or LNG um, in, that, in that sense. Um, typically, we, we compress that natural gas from a transmission or distribution pipeline. Um, it's, it's usually um, distribution grade gas. Natural gas, or CNG, is about 30% lower cost than most of their fuels out there and has also less greenhouse gas emission. So one of the reasons that, that CNG is, is very good for as an industrial gas is, is cost. And uh, as you can see from the graph there, um, in the past, the cost of oil and the cost of natural gas have been very similar when put on, a, on an energy scale. 
Um, and that's from 2000 to about 2009, those costs follow each other fairly closely. And once there was some major discoveries, discoveries of natural gas, um, the price sort of, there was a much larger disparity between the prices. And so uh, today you can see that oil is, is a lot more money per diesel gallon equivalent than natural gas as, as a commodity. As a commodity. Uh, and when you get into factories and, and that type of thing, using a lot of diesel or bulk oil, um, moving to natural gas is, is a much more cost-effective solution. Of course, if natural gas pipelines aren't available, um, we need to figure out a way to get the natural gas there, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, the other benefit, one of the other benefits of, of natural gas as an industrial gas is it has a much lower environmental impact. Uh, you can see from the, from the graphic there, um, sulfur dioxides, nitrogen dioxides, carbon monoxides, all those um, nasty environmental chemicals that we are releasing when burning diesel, um, they're, they're much less with natural gas. And uh, that, that allows, you know, when you're getting into issues of burning diesels um, and having environmental problems, uh, natural gas can often, just by itself, uh, remove a lot of those concerns. The other thing with natural gas is, believe it or not, it is safer. Um, although it's, it's flammable and it's compressed to high pressures, um, it's non-toxic, it's lighter than air, and therefore it disperses very quickly if there is a leak. It has a much higher ignition temperature than gasoline or diesel as well. So if there are sparks um, present or, or flames present, um, it takes a lot more to ignite it. Um, it has a very narrow flammability range. Uh, it only burns between 5 and 15 percent. Um, and right now, uh, the CNG industry, as, as Dave mentioned, is, is we, we started in this business in about 1984. And so there's been uh, a lot of developments to storage vessels, um, and, and the standards there are, are, are second to none. Um, and and the, the safety records are also very good. You can see in the graphic, we, there's more than 20 million vehicles right now in the world running on natural gas. So this is not a, you know, a, an emerging um, fuel. Uh, it's been used for a long time and, and with a good safety record. So where natural gas is mainly focused on in the past is, is vehicles. And you can see, you know, we, today, and we, we're still in that business for sure, it, we fill vehicles, we, you know, cars, buses, uh, garbage trucks. Um, and that's, that's been the primary use. And, and it's been very effective there to, again, reduce costs, lower environmental impact. Um, it's been a good alternative fuel. But the industrial gas concept now takes that compressed natural gas and really moves it to customers that aren't vehicles that are off of the pipeline and, and allows us to um, provide those customers as well with natural gas to, to reap some of those benefits. So the, the high level view of the high level concept um, is, is basically made up of five parts. And we'll go into detail on each part, but this is I'll give you an overview. So we first start with a gas pipeline. Um, we move then into compression, and typically that's what IMW has been doing for a long time. Um, but instead of filling vehicles, we're actually filling uh, either tube trailers or large uh, industrial gas cylinders with natural gas. So we're transporting them usually by road, but also sometimes by, by uh, waterways um, to a commercial customer. And at that commercial customer site, we introduce decompression and uh, pressure reduction systems to safely remove the gas from the trailer and deliver it to that customer. Um, you'll hear me use the terminology mother station and daughter station. The mother station really is the gas pipeline and the compression, and the daughter station is the decompression and the end, the end customer. Um, so as end users, um, there's a huge potential for this, for this uh, industrial gas, um, for natural gas as an industrial gas. And I've, I've attached some pictures there. You can see um, in the top left, uh, there's a fracking site. A lot of drilling sites are using diesel right now and definitely can use natural gas. Uh, there's hospitals who use uh, diesel for heating in a lot of places in even North America. Um, there's power plants that are running off of diesel still today, especially on the Atlantic coast. Um, and there's also, as we continue clockwise around the, those pictures, there's uh, asphalt plants that are burning a lot of diesel. Um, and then there's also aluminum smelters and other, other metal manufacturing um, Industries that as well are using are using natural gas are using diesel today and and could use natural gas. So there's a huge uh, potential for this, and uh, we're seeing as a as a manufacturer this demand is picking up very very quickly, and it's definitely a good business to be in 
uh, right now as far as we, we believe. So let's talk a little bit about the components. Um, basically, the first component uh, is the pipeline. And so when you're working on, a, on an industrial gas project and you want to move gas from one point to another point, you're going to look for a, a high pressure pipeline. And, and the reason is very simple is if you're compressing gas to about 3,600 PSI or 250 bar into a trailer, the higher pressure you start with, the more effective um, or the less energy you put in when you compress that gas. Um, and you they basically have less energy consumption. The uh, location of the mother station where this pipeline is is often flexible. So the customer, the end user has a factory that's at a fixed location, but the, the pipeline, um, they can choose a pipeline often that that has a high pressure or is, is close, as close to the site as possible. Um, you obviously want to reduce the transportation uh, kilometers and also reduce the, the energy consumption that you're putting in. Um, when, when going into, into industrial gas, what, when you're compressing gas to high pressures and then also expanding it to low pressures later on, you want to make sure that you have low water content in your gas pipeline. Uh, what happens is as you compress gas, it, it heats up, and when you decompress gas at the other end, it cools down. And we can see, and we'll talk about temperatures a little bit more later on, but you can see very low temperatures that appear from this, and having wet gas causes a lot of issues uh, with ice formations and that type of thing in the decompression equipment. So whenever you're compressing gas from a pipeline, if the, gas, if the water content is not low, um, we, we really recommend the use of a gas dryer to, to bring that water content low. Um, the other thing that you want to keep in mind is, is using natural gas with at least 90% methane. Um, when you've got a lot of heavy hydrocarbons, when you're getting into a lot of ethane, propane, uh, butane, and, and such, um, again, those compounds will easily drop out at the low temperatures. And so when, when we look at a project, we always ensure that the, the gas composition of the natural gas is is um, a quality such that we won't have a lot of uh, heavy hydrocarbons dropping out on the decompression end. So we move to the compression, the mother station. Um, typically, when you're filling tube trailers with gas, you're going to have a lot of a lot of horsepower. You're going to have a lot of compression. Um, depending on the size of the operation, you usually want to fill the trailers fairly quickly. Um, those trailers, we'll talk about in a little bit, but they're not, a, they're not cheap. They're, they're, you're investing a lot of money in them and you want to have them on the road as much as possible. So typically what we've seen is the sites uh, vary between about 500 and 3,000 horsepower. Um, and we often use multiple compressors for that. There's some advantages of using multiple compressors as well as you get redundancy built in and you also get uh, lower starting uh, um, currents on your electrical grid. The other thing that we really focus on with um, transporting natural gas is, is our non-loop technology. Um, and it's really important to ensure you're pumping a lot of, gas, a lot of oil into your gas. And, and the reason is very simple is if you have oil getting into your cylinders and injecting into your cylinders, over time it's difficult to continue to remove that oil. And what happens is the oil transfers into gas and it falls out into the trailers and you pay a lot of money for a trailer and, and suddenly you're filling it up with oil and having to drain it and then dispose of that oil. Um, and with IMW's compressors, of course, we are a non-lube uh, compressor manufacturer. We have less than five parts per million of, of oil even being introduced into the system and that really helps us not have to worry about having oil collecting into, into those cylinders. And it gives you the maximum capacity in the cylinder that, that you can have. Um, one thing to note too is that uh, sometimes the, the, the best sites are not necessarily near major electric centers um, and or major power lines and, and depending on the country that you're in as well um, that may not be an option and so instead of getting a large gen set to run electric driven compressors um, we often do engine drive compressors there where the the prime mover is it is an actual a natural gas powered engine um, and there's some advantages to that and you can see on the graphic there those particular machines are actually in Indonesia at one of our sites and and they're uh, Caterpillar engine drive units with uh, radiators outside the skid. So at a mother station, we have a few pieces of equipment that are typically there. We have the compressors, which we talked about already. We also have chillers, and we'll talk a bit about more a bit more about full fill technology. 
but the chillers are really um, there to cool the gas. When you, when you take gas and you compress it into a trailer, um, it heats up. And, and this is one of the challenges of, of moving natural gas from one place to the next is, is the heat generation. Um, so we'll talk a bit about chillers, but basically we, we, we send the gas once it's compressed through some high pressure heat exchangers and we use a, basically an industrial grade chiller to, to cool that gas before we put it into the, into the trailer. The other thing that we have is, is fill posts. Um, basically these are you know, have flexible hoses attached to them. They're what connect directly to the trailer. And they have, you know, different pressures and temperature sensors to ensure that we're filling these trailers, um, you know, to 100% fill, but not obviously over that. That would be a safety problem. And not under that where we have, you know, inefficiencies in, in transport. So full fill technology, uh, IMW has been working a lot on this. Um, the, the name of this game in, in natural gas transportation is to, is to fill your trailers up to 100%. If you're driving back and forth with an 80% full trailer, um, the economics just don't work as well as if you have 100%. Um, and if you need to buy an extra trailer because you aren't sure you're going to get 100% fill, then that adds a lot of cost as well. So basically our full fill technology um, has a few different pieces, but the goal of it is to ensure that every trailer is filled quickly and, and as completely as possible. Um, and what we're doing there is, is different ways of, of cooling. As we talked about with the chillers, we have some other technologies as well that we're working on to, to make sure that that gas is entering as, as cool as possible. But then also tracking you know, how many, how many pounds or kilograms of gas are actually going into the trailer and, and making sure we don't have, um, again, too much or too little gas. So um, it's proprietary technology that we're using, um, but we are seeing um, locations all over the world now that are, that are getting these full fills. So the, the next piece is transportation. Um, the transportation is the most significant cost driver of these of these projects, um, and there's a couple different. We'll talk a little bit about the the trailers. Um, obviously, there's there's different manufacturers out there for the trailers. Um, some of you may even be on the call. Some of our some of the people we work with. Um, I've picked a few of the popular ones we've worked with, but uh, you know there's there's a lot more out there, of course, as well. But essentially, in the industry, there's a few different types of cylinders. There's um, type 1 through 4, and we'll spend a bit of time going through those. Uh, type 1 is 100% is steel cylinder. Uh, it's made out of steel. Um, it's fairly heavy. It carries less because of the weight restrictions on transportation, but it's the lowest cost. And so if you've got a site that is, um, you know, the mother and the daughter stations are quite close, this, this often works. As well as if you're, if you're transporting the gas via a ship or somewhere where the weight is not as much of an issue, um, these, these cylinders are good as well. The Type 2 is, is a hoop wrap steel. Basically, it's a steel cylinder, but you are, take a little bit of uh, weight out of it, costs a little bit more as well, and carries a bit more. Um, type 3 is a hoop wrapped aluminum cylinder. Um, it's definitely a lot lighter. Um, it, it has a large payload, but the cost is, is high compared to the steel um, when you look at you know, uh, trailer per trailer. Um, the, the last type is a Type 4, which is a fully composite trailer. Um, it's very light, has a large payload, but of course the cost is high as well. And our rule of thumb when we recommend trailers is to, is to look at the distance you're traveling. If you're traveling a long distance over a couple hundred or a hundred miles or a couple hundred kilometers, um, you're going to want to go to a Type 3 or 4 cylinder um, because then it pays to, to spend the money on the cylinders because they're on the road a lot longer. So IMW deals with all these vendors uh, directly. We've also done a lot of work modeling the filling of these trailers. Um, it's not well understood yet in the industry exactly how these trailers are filled and how the temperatures, you know, what temperatures we achieve during filling and during uh, the decanting or emptying of the cylinders. So IMW has actually got some proprietary models we've developed to predict those temperatures and ensure that as part of our full fill technology and also our maximum offload capacity um, technology that we ensure we, we fill as much gas as possible and also remove as much gas as possible, um, again, to help the economics of the projects. So 
then we get to the daughter station. Uh, there's what we call our decompression side. So you've got a full trailer of gas has arrived at your site, and now we need to take that gas and, and basically pull it down um, into the end customer's um, factory or, or whatever use they've got. Typically, the, the, the pressures that the end customer is working with are in, in the re order of a few, a few bar or 50 to 100 PSI. Um, there are some power plants we've worked with that are much higher. They could be 50 bar. Um, but typically, you're draining the trailers with free flow down to the end use. The first, uh, we'll talk about each of the components in, in detail. But basically, there's three components of these sites. There's a decanting post. Uh, which is essentially the opposite of a fill post to remove that uh, that gas from the trailer via hoses. Uh, there's a pressure reduction module which reduces the pressure, as it says, and a heating module which helps warm the gas up. So the decanting post, um, typically we're using large one-inch hoses. Um, we use multiples of them depending on the flow rates of the system. Um, we've got emergency shutoff valves for safety, uh, both manual and automatic. We measure temperature and pressure, again, to ensure that we can remove as much gas as possible from the trailer. Um, and we also have to look at low temperature construction. Um, when we're using a type 3 or 4 cylinder, uh, we will often see temperatures below minus 40 Celsius or Fahrenheit. Um, and so the, the materials of construction are very important to look at um, when we're pulling that gas off. We also provide some overpressure protection um, just to make sure that the temp pressures in the trailers haven't gone too high and that the equipment is protected properly. The pressure reducing module, um, basically it consists of a few different components. Uh, the emergency shutoff valve, again for safety, if there's a, um, you know, an incident or an ESD, we, we can isolate the gas and keep it from flowing to the rest of the system. Uh, we have heat exchangers. These are high pressure shell and tube heat exchangers that we use. And we first heat the gas. Um, a little bit different than other manufacturers that are out there, but we essentially like to heat the gas first. It's, it's, we believe it's more efficient. Um, and then we regulate the gas down usually in two stages um, with, with different pressure regulators or control valves. Um, this is really the heart of the, the technology, um, the control logic and, and how exactly this, this is, is working is, is very difficult. Um, Really what you have to do is make sure that you can flow gas at a high pressure and heat it sufficiently, but also flow gas when the trailer is nearing its empty point and, and not, have not, not have too much pressure drop. So it has to be designed very carefully. And, and when you're looking at this type of equipment, you need to make sure you have a, a supplier that is um, well versed in this. Um, it, it looks like it might be easy to do, but it's the control, the control is definitely the, the difficult part. Um, the other part that's very uh, critical is the overpressure protection. So when you are re reducing the pressure, um, you need to make sure that if a regulator fails or is not operating correctly, you have sufficient overpressure protection to protect the customer's downstream system. Um, when you're dealing with high pressures, 250 bar, 3600 psi on the inlet, um, the, the end customer obviously can't have that going into their, into their system. Dave, we just got a question here. Um, Julio is asking, do you install a gas meter at, in the decanting post? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, typically, we do not, and, and, but we, we could. Typically, we'll put the, the meter uh, downstream of the PRS. So on the, on the pressure reduction system outlet is where we'll install that meter. And the reason is, is, us, is pretty simple, is the cost of the meter tends to be less at, when, with a lower pressure rating. So putting a meter on a, on a 250 bar line typically costs more than putting one on a 4 bar line. And so we'll use that, that meter. And there was a follow-up question. What fluid is used in the heat exchanger? Yeah, we'll get to the heat exchanger module in a minute, and I'll, I'll maybe answer that there. Um, I just wanted to mention one more thing about the metering as well. If, when, you've, when you use a high-pressure meter um, on the inlet of the PRS or on the decanting post, you have to consider pressure drop because when the trailer is down at say 20 bar or a few hundred psi, um, the gas, the flow rate of the gas has to remain the same. The customer is still using the same amount of gas, but you need to put it through those that the system. And so the flow meter may be a small flow meter that is good for the high pressure, but when you put the low pressure gas through, your pressure drop is very high. Um, and so getting a, a meter that's large enough 
to, you know, handle the low pressure gas and high enough pressure to handle the high pressure gas can be difficult. Um, so yeah, we'll move to the 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 uh, heating control module. Um, we provide heat for the PRM heat exchangers. We typically use a 50% glycol, ethylene glycol water mixture um, to heat the gas. And the reason is, is, is oftentimes the temperatures in the system are quite, quite low or the ambient's low. Um, in hot climates, we can use a 10% mixture instead of a 50% mixture. Um, but basically, the heating control module it consists of a few pieces. Um, it's got a, an industrial grade boiler. Um, basically, it's a gas-powered boiler that heats up, like we said, a uh, glycol mixture. Um, it includes some pumps and water control valves to divert the, ga the, the water flow to the heat exchangers that are on the, on the PRM. Um, and it also, controls the, also houses the PLC and the electrical cabinet. Um, one thing to note with, with pressure-reducing modules and heating control modules, the pressure-reducing module is has a hazardous area around it. We've got natural gas, it's flammable, and so there's a, depending on the country that you're in, there's a hazardous area that, that is generated. And the heating control module typically is, is non-hazardous. The boilers are, have open flames, you're not going to put them near a hazardous area where gas could be present. And so these two modules are typically separated either, either physically just by a certain distance or by a, a wall or by some sort of sealed partition, uh, depending on the design of the, of the unit. And so because it's a non-hazardous non area, we also usually include the electrical components there. So the, the modules we showed you are standalone modules. Um, we, you know, some customers prefer to have those. They can mount them outdoors and, and use them as, as that. Um, one thing that IMW is working on a lot lately uh, is developing all-in-one pressure reducing systems. Um, you can see on the right, this is a mobile pressure reducing system that we're currently developing. Uh, we've got uh, two prototypes that are in the field, and this is the uh, this is now the second generation that we're working on. Basically, this unit is is fully mobile. It can be pulled by a, a one-ton pickup truck, so it's fairly lightweight. Um, it can flow about 1,250 SCFM maximum, and uh, basically, you can connect your trailers directly to this unit. You reduce the pressure via the the PRM side, which is on the back, and then has a sealed wall to the HCM side, which is on the front, which also contains all the controls. Um, the other unit that's shown on the bottom, the CAD model there, is a larger um, uh, fixed uh, all-in-one pressure reducing system. Um, again, higher flows, and often we, we build redundancy into these systems as well for critical customers. So maximum offload capacity we touched on a little bit already, but basically um, there's a, a few different methods that we use to, to remove as much gas from the trailer as possible. And again, I think the, the reason is fairly obvious, but I'll, I'll explain a little bit that when we, when we drive the trailers away, we don't want to have a lot of gas left in them. If you're driving a trailer away with 25% of the gas in, that means that each trip you're taking, you've, you've delivered less gas than, than you should be. And so our goal typically is to have between 5 and 10 percent of the gas left in the trailers, no more than 10 percent typically. Um, and so there's different ways of doing that. We use two-line unloading methodologies um, where possible. Basically, we just you know, have, have two different systems that are pulling the gas off the trailer. One's a high pressure, one's a low pressure. Um, we obviously pay a lot of attention to the site piping sizing and also the PRS sizing to make sure that the pressure drops are very low. Uh, the less pressure drop we have, the lower we can empty that trailer to. And we also do scavenging compression sometimes where we'll actually install a compressor to basically pull the gas out of the trailer and, and boost it back up to the end user. And so again, depending on your, on your scenario, um, each of these, these, uh, these methodologies can be, can be used um, and we've, we've used them successfully. The other thing that, that we've worked a lot on is scalability. Um, a lot of times customers will start with a smaller um, rollout and they'll want to add to it later or they'll start with a, a large, layout, large rollout right away but want to have some redundancy built in. Um, and so what IMW has done a lot of is, is developing standard product um, that we can successfully 
basically put in parallel with, with, with each other. Um, that gives the redundancy right off the bat. It also ensures, because you're ordering a standard product, that you've got a reliable and quality product that's, that's been tested. It's not a custom unit every time. Um, and of course, if your demand increases, you can add more units. And so as you can see on this photo here, this particular one had seven uh, 2,000 cubic meter PRSs installed in parallel. Um, and uh, it's a very efficient system um, from that point of view. Dave, just a couple of questions. Um, how far is the longest stretch for transporting gas by virtual pipeline? Typically, um, we see about 400 kilometers one way is sort of where it maxes out. Uh, but there are a lot of variables that are in play. Um, it depends on, on your local jurisdictions for how much gas you can transport per trip. Um, but usually, once you're about 400, 500 kilometers, um, people start looking at LNG, other technologies, um, to, to do that. Uh, we have a lot of projects that are in the sort of 300 kilometer range one way, and they work quite well. And, and how much pressure loss occurs when the natural gas is being transported? Um, the pressure loss, when you fill a trailer, you're filling actual kilograms or pounds of gas. And so when the trailer leaves, it, typically the gas is warm. Um, because because of the, the nature of putting the gas in, in inside the trailer, and so as you as you drive you know a couple hours, the gas will cool down because of the ambient, um, although very slowly is is what our modeling and, and actual experience is showing, um, but the pressure will reduce somewhat because of the temperature decrease, um, but the, obviously the the kilograms of gas or the pounds of gas remain the same. There's no venting during transport at all. So the gas that you loaded in is the same gas that you're taking back out. Okay, just one more right now. Um, where trailers do multiple drops, what metering systems are most commonly used? Uh, turbine or mass flow meters? Uh, again, it depends on the application, but typically we'll use a turbine meter on the outlet of the PRS systems. Um, Mass flow meters are, are, are good as well. Uh, typically, we'll use the mass flow meters on the filling side to figure out how much mass we're putting into the trailer. And we'll use a turbine custody grade transfer turbine meter on the outlet. Um, we have also used uh, mass flow meters on the outlet of the PRS as well. So it, it depends on your application. It depends on the flow rates. Um, our standard is to use turbine meters on the outlet. Again, as we mentioned earlier, because of cost, typically, and, and the accuracy is very good on them as well. So we'll look at a few case studies. Um, these are projects that IMW successfully rolled out, and it gives you a flavor of, of some of, of what's possible for, for different customers in different uh, places. So the first uh, one I want to talk a little bit about, and this is uh, not actually an industrial gas um, project, but it's, it's one of the forerunners of, of this technology is a city uh, called Urumuchi in, in western, northwestern China. Um, IMW started filling tube trailers at this site with our equipment about 10 years ago, um, more than 10 years ago, uh, or actually. And this particular uh, company is delivering uh, natural gas tube trailers all over the city uh, from, from this large mother station that's shown in the picture. Um, what they're actually doing with the gas is they're not fueling a residential or, or, or um, industrial or commercial customer, they're actually fueling vehicles. And so we use essentially a scavenging type or we call a daughter compressor um, to remove the gas from the trailer and, and pump it back into vehicle tanks. And since IMW has been involved in this a long time, it, it taught us a lot about how to fill the trailers effectively and also how to re empty the, the trailers effectively. And so when we got into uh, commercial applications, this was sort of the uh, the pilot that we had and the experience that we had gained. Typically, IMW, for the last 10 years in, in uh, natural gas transport, has been involved in countries overseas. Um, uh, we've done a lot of projects in Indonesia, Thailand, Nigeria. Um, and it's often thought that in North America, the pipeline infrastructure is good enough that there, there's not a lot of you know opportunities for this. And the first project that really IMW started working on in, in Canada was East Coast Canada uh, for a company called Cavendish Farms. And uh, this, this particular project is, is transporting gas from New Brunswick uh, over a very long bridge, the Confederation Bridge, to Prince Edward Island and supplying a, a factory 
a food processing plant with natural gas. Um, it offsets about 22 million liters of heavy fuel annually. Um, this project's been in operation for three or four years now, uh, very successfully, um, and it's flowing about 5,600 center cubic feet per minute. Um, they're using type 1 trailers. You can see the round trip is about 140 kilometers, so it's a good application for type 1 uh, trailers. The other project that uh, is a good case study is one that we're running right now in Mexico. Um, it's, it's supplying uh, fuel to a, a factory, a beer factory, and uh, essentially it's about 100 it's about 160 kilometers, actually one way, 320 kilometer round trip. And they're using Type 4 trailers. The flow capacity is about 16,000 standard cubic meters an hour, so this is a very large site. Uh, you can see on the picture, this is where we're using multiple standard 2,000 cubic meter units in parallel. Um, and this site has been operating for about six months now. The other site that we're just uh, shipping our first equipment to right now is a large uh, customer in Australia. Uh, this is northern Australia or northwestern Australia. Um, and we're providing natural gas into a 100 megawatt power plant. So this power plant currently is running on diesel. Uh, the gas pipeline has not arrived yet. It is going to be arriving soon. Um, but in the meantime, um, it made sense to actually um, supply gas um, from a large pipeline to this remote industrial plant. Um, and in this particular case, they're using Type 3 trailers for about a 600 kilometer round trip. So that's the presentation, um, and I'll hand it over to Dave. Okay, so Dave, we've got a couple of more questions here. Um, how would the system change if used for transporting LNG? LNG is really a whole different ballgame. Um, LNG is a cryogenic fluid. It needs to be very cool. Um, it also has a much lower pressure. And so the equipment that you're using is, is entirely different. Um, our parent company, Clean Energy, and our sister company, um, North Star, do a lot of LNG work. And IMW is starting to get into this work as well. Um, but really, you're looking at um, LNG production. You're looking at cryogenic pumps into trailers. And then you're looking at um, you're looking at vaporization at a, a, a daughter side from the from the liquefied natural gas and turning it into compressed natural gas or low pressure natural gas again. Um, so the systems are a lot different. Typically the costs are a lot higher, and so either you need a very large project to make it work, or you need very long distances to make it work. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chopra asks, uh, does IMW install booster units at the daughter station? Yes, and that's what we call them scavenging compressors, but booster compressors are, are, are the same terminology. Um, again, depending on the, on the customer's outlet pressure, um, if the outlet pressure is above, say, 10 bar or 150 PSI, we want to remove more gas from the trailer. We're not happy just training the trailer to, say, to 30 bar. We typically want it down to about 20 bar. And so we'll install compression to pull the gas from the trailer and put it into the customer's end use. Um, we also have done some work if, if the customer needs large amounts of storage um, as, as backup. So if, if the supply of the trailers is not guaranteed, um, some customers will put in large amounts of storage at their uh, daughter station to ensure that they have a supply of gas. And in that case, we'll also use booster compressors to um, fill that storage and, and unload that storage effectively. And we've got a question, probably the question on most people's minds, on ROI for industrial gas transport. I know there's many variables, but maybe uh, use some of the examples, the case studies you had, just to give a, a general sense. Sure. Uh, the ROI on some of these projects, quite frankly, is stunning. Um, I can't talk details about customers, obviously, but um, what we're seeing is that customers can spend several million dollars offsetting a diesel, and they may be offsetting uh, millions of dollars of diesel every year. Um, typically, the, the, the rough cost savings diesel and natural gas is you're saving at least 30%. And so depending on how much diesel you're consuming currently or, or bulk oil you're, you're, cons you're consuming, um, a lot of these projects have a payback of 18 months or less um, and, and full payback. It's, it's, it's pretty stunning. Um, and this is, I think, really why this industry is starting to really realize that there's this is a very, very good opportunity. Um, one 
question here um, that came in that I hear continuously. Why one? Why would you choose CNG transportation over LNG transportation? It's a very good question, um, and probably not a not an easy one to answer. It depends who you're talking to. But in in the context of this of what we're talking about today, um, industrial gas, um, CNG rolling out industrial gas as in compressed natural gas is a fairly simple undertaking. Um, there, there's not a lot of, um, you know, there's capital costs for sure, but it's a lot less than LNG typically. Um, it depends on where your LNG source is. So if you've got an LNG um, offload facility, say by a port, or you've got an LNG production facility very close, uh, LNG could make sense depending on where your final customer is. But if you've got nothing and you're starting from scratch, uh, producing LNG is, is an expensive, um, I shouldn't say expensive, but it, it costs a lot to get going. The, the small scale is already very large. And when you've got a lot of the projects that we're looking at, um, the flow rates and the, and the actual um, gas that we're transporting is, is not large enough to justify the expense of the capital expense of the LNG production. Yeah. OK, so Dale is asking, um, are you providing gas directly to truck fleets? If so, what is the DGE delivered cost, dollar per DGE? Yeah, definitely uh, we are doing that. Um, that's our, sort of has been our main focus, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, is, is actually fueling truck fleets or, or bus fleets or whatever you, you may have um, with natural gas. Um, the, the delivered DGE price I'm, I don't, I mean, again, it depends on, on where you are, um, which area of the world, but also which area of the United States you are. Um, typically, the cost savings on diesel to natural gas delivered is, is 30 to 50 percent. Um, and that's definitely something that, that IMW can, can help you with, for sure. Okay, Gary's asking, does IMW conduct functional, uh, functionality tests under severe climactic conditions? in particular for the mother compressor station? The answer is yes, um, to a limited sense. It really depends on, on what the tests need to be. Um, IMW, when we test our compression equipment at our factory here, uh, we put it through um, different ambient uh, scenarios in terms of the gas supply. So we, we can heat the incoming gas up to reflect what would be at site. Um, we also do some simulations to ensure that if, if the ambient's high, we, we are, you know, going to have the desired performance. Um, oftentimes, when we're testing the, the compression equipment here, we don't actually run it at, for instance, 50 Celsius if you, if you have a 50 Celsius uh, end-use application. Um, but with modeling and with, with the studies and the experience we've had, um, we can correlate that very well. Um, we, IMW does have a lot of experience with running compression and decompression equipment in very hot climates. Um, and so we, we believe with the experience and with the testing and the correlations we do, we can successfully test that equipment and, and ensure it will, it will run properly. Okay. Um, Berna is asking, if one were loading trucks, would you need a PRS also or just a compressor? On the loading side, on the loading side, you, you just need uh, compression. Um, the, the PRS is, is to pull the gas from the trailer to an end use. Um, if you are loading trucks at a daughter side, so you've got, you know, you don't have a pipeline, you're going to transport the gas, and then you're going to take the gas from the trailer and fill a fleet of vehicles, which is what we mentioned in, in, in northwestern China, what they're doing, um, then you would, instead of a PRS, you'd actually put in a booster compressor or a daughter compressor or a scavenger compressor, depending on the terminology, and, and use that to, uh, to take the gas from the trailer and compress it into your vehicles. OK. Um, Mark is asking, what model booster compressor do you use for a daughter station filling vehicles? Is, is there a vehicle dispenser involved? Yeah, we, we use our MW50 technology um, as a booster compressor. Um, we, we have different ways of configuring it, and so it's our own proprietary um, compressor frame that we use for the boosters. Um, and yes, basically from the booster side, the discharge of the booster compressor is going to be the same sort of 36 or 4500 PSI that you, you would use in a conventional station. And so 
the dispensing, the priority panel, all the other equipment is very similar to what you'd find at a, at a station that is connected to a pipeline. Um, so same, same, same dispensing equipment. Okay, uh, Ryan is asking what is the typical investment for a daughter station? Again, it depends on size. Um, uh, some of our smaller sites um, providing fuel to a, you know, a small size factory, um, you're looking at probably um, $300,000 to $500,000 um, on, on the daughter station equipment um, itself. Um, the larger ones can, can be up to a million dollars. It really depends on, on the site. Uh, this is a question I hear a lot. What's the price range for the tube trailers, cheapest to the most expensive you've seen? Um, usually, again, depending on the size, there's different lengths and different um, classifications, but the tube trailers typically run from about $200,000 a piece to about four hundred dollars to $500,000 a piece. Um, and again, depending on your distances and, and your flows, you may need six to ten of these. So the tube trailers typically are, are the biggest investment, um, but they're all obviously also critical to the application. This is an interesting one. Um, do you recommend transportation through tube trailer in case of bad road conditions in the countryside? Is there a safety worry? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, what we found is most of the, the applications we have, the road networks are fairly good. Um, but if you've got hazardous road areas or unpredictable road surfaces, um, it's definitely something you'll have to put into the equation of, of your ROI and also into the feasibility studies. Um, it's hard to answer the question, it's a bit generic, but the, the short answer is, is when you've got high pressure natural gas and you're transporting it, um, the, 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 the containers are very safe, they're very tested, um, the, the trucks are, are, you know, the technology is not a problem, but it's going to be more of an ROI and a, and a commercial impact if you've got um, bad road surfaces. Okay. Um, I'm not sure that you'll be able to answer this, Dave, but do insurance rates vary for fuel haulers based on using class one, two, three, or four tanks? That's a very good question. I, I honestly do not know. Um, we definitely can get back to you on that one. Um, uh, we have contacts that would be able to find that out. Okay. Um, where in uh, the Americas can one visit an NGV filling station fed by trailers, uh, like, say, Titan? Alex is asking. In North America, as far as I know, there is no NGV, which is, you know, filling vehicles with natural gas at a daughter station. Um, as far as I know, they don't exist. Um, but there are several sites in North America that are using trailers to unload into, into industrial uses like factories. Um, if you contact our sales group, we definitely can, can figure out those locations and, and tour you through if you're interested. Okay, we've got a ton of questions coming at us here. Um, can CNG be offloaded directly to underground cylinders and later have vehicles filled from it, just uh, as in the fuel uh, diesel environment? It's a good question, and, and the short answer is no. Um, the reason is you, you need to compress it. And, and gas, when you have natural gas or any type of gas, it flows via pressure differential. And so your trailer has a high pressure. Your, your storage uh, might have a low pressure. And so for a while, it'll drain and it'll eventually equalize. Um, but equalization is not good enough. You want to remove all the gas from your, your trailer and put it all into your storage. And that requires some form of compression. And that's typically where we would install our booster or scavenging compression to pull the gas from the trailer into the storage. Okay, uh, we're at uh, 55 minutes. Um, I think we'll uh, cut it here. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, thank you, everybody, for the significant number of questions. Uh, just so everybody knows, uh, these presentations are edited and posted to our website. Um, we and uh, as well the recordings are posted to our YouTube site. You can go to the YouTube site today and you will see um, the previous two presentations already posted uh, that you can utilize. Feel free to use as training or, or marketing materials. Uh, you will shortly within a week also have access um, via our website to the presentations. Uh, again, um, we will uh, send out a survey um, after this uh, that will also point you towards the upcoming 
three new presentations, uh, May the 22nd, uh, LNG fueling station technology by our friends at Northstar. On the June the 23rd, uh, Steve Ubora is joining us again for facility modifications. This is an interesting uh, um, industry generic presentation on, on what you should consider if you're uh, converting your fleet to CNG um, uh, in your facilities where you service these vehicles. Uh, on July the 24th, uh, potential for biomethane as a fuel for fleet vehicles. Uh, interesting presentation. Um, so I encourage you all, go to our website, uh, click on these, sign up uh, as often you, as you like. Um, we're, we're thrilled to have you join us each time. Again, for our uh, engineering friends who are joining us, you, all you professional engineers, uh, please uh, send in uh, your name, uh, email address uh, uh, to our um, uh, IMW webinars uh, email address so that we can send you a confirmation for your uh, informal education credit. Uh, and I believe that is all we have for today. Thank you for your questions. Oh, one last thing. Additional information, uh, you can go to the website uh, under contact us uh, if you'd like additional information. There's two ways. There's a generic form you can fill in, send it in if it's just a general question. If you've got a specific fleet requirement, um, you can go to our RFQ form and it gets real detailed. Uh, you can send over the specs you're looking specifically for and we'll get back to you right away. So once again, thank you for joining us. Uh, please join us again next month, and uh, we look forward to continuing the series for you.